And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way from the black country, creator of... Uh, uh, dang it, I screwed, I screwed up my intro this early already. <laughs> Great. <laughs> creator of Chivalry and Sorcery, and, and is now bringing back the Land of the Rising Sun expansion, the one and only Steven Turner. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight? I'm doing fine, thank you. Yes, it's uh, early evening here in the UK. Yeah, it's look as as I've mentioned in the past. I have a, I have I have a I have entire volumes dedicated to my unending hatred of time zones. To the point where I could probably fill a whole shelf with them. I know that feeling. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, when it now um. Obviously, this is this is my first this is my first rodeo when it comes to chivalry and sorcery, and I will admit in full disclosure that I was one of the backers when it when it came back with um, fifth edition. Um, but uh, I hope you didn't break your wrists when you picked it up. I can't. I used to ca I used to carry around. I used to I used to have to carry around um, ro road road salt for a living. <laughs> Plus, um, whenever whenever somebody compl whenever somebody complains that that um so that certain ga that certain more accessible games are too complicated, I have threatened to throw my co my copy of Hero System at them. Yeah. Oh. Because I, or, because I often I often hear the whole. There are some cases where I'm willing to accept the whole too complicated, like with like with say Phoenix Command back in the day, which is why I will never run that unless I'm paid. But uh, I've only run, I've only run that once. I only ran it because of the because of the Aliens RPG that used the same system, and I'm not touching that again. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. There there was that. There was that trend, I want to say, in the '80s of tr of trying to put charts on ev of trying to put charts on everything, and some people did it better than others. Yes. Yeah, I remember that time. But well, let me let me make sure I get this set up. Think. Um. So, you've you've been you've been involved you've been involved with wargaming and um role play and role playing since since it's early since it's early inceptions in the in the 70s and uh, yeah, I, I, I started role playing in 79 mm -hmm. um now obvi obviously because of that you were you were at the forefront when when it came to the transition between wargaming and um role playing and while I've while I have some experience on on how that transition played out in the states, I'm curious what the scene what the scene was like with the early um with the early role playing scene in the UK. Um, it was very very small. Um, certainly from those of us who were wargaming to start with, mm -hmm. transitioning to role playing, it was through introductions from friends who had older brothers at university who managed to get the hands on the old white box. Mm -hmm. And their first experience was uh, when Games Workshop got a license to print softback editions of AD&D, Player's Handbook and Monster Manual. And there was no guidance for us at all. And it was very hit and miss. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was transitioning from being used to handling lots of miniatures on the table to suddenly only having one miniature. And there was an initial culture shock. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were very reliant on magazines like White Dwarf in the early days. Yeah, and I've I've gone yeah. I've gone through a few issues of White Dwarf, but obviously it was a little harder to get that over here. Yeah, it's in same similar way it was 
very hard for us to get Dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and everything that we, we picked up from Dragon was what was referred to in White Dwarf. Yeah, when it came, now when it came to when it came to the er, the early wargaming days, like when I when I was doing research on the wargaming scene in the se in the seventies, the name that would always the name that would always come up was Avalon Hill. Was that the case with the wargaming scene in the UK at that time? Uh, definitely not. It would be uh, things like the wargame research group and uh, for ancients and. Uh, you, you generally find groups that have got their own, own home rules and you pick up the odd book and it would be giving you directions on how to create your own set of rules for whatever period took your fancy. Mm -hmm. So it was... I didn't encounter Avalon Hill until well after TSR had taken it over. No, that which makes, which makes sense. And now, if now if I recall correctly from my own research, the um, the inception of chivalry and sorcery was a response to the to um, criticisms that you had with AD and D at the time. Yeah, uh, the original writers Ed Simblis and Wolf Bacchus uh, had decided that original D and D didn't have any sort of foundation, any society to back up what would simply just dungeon crawls. Mm -hmm. And they created their house rule D and D, for want of a better word, and call it Chevalier. Uh, went along to Gen Con to offer it to TSR, and had a change of tact and encountered Scott Bizarre at uh, FGU, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he took it. I uh, contracted with them and published it as Shimmering Sorcery First Edition. Uh, the original red book. Yep. Yeah. And what I do, what I do find interesting is that that sort of response thing is 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 not is not an isolated case because um, the way Rollmaster got set got set up isn't too far removed. It was it was a set of house rules for AD and D that just ballooned out of control. Yeah, it's almost like Pathfinder. Uh, well, the the more things don't change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> yes. But but even even within even within that, um, when it can, now obvious obviously this isn't the first rodeo when it comes to the Land of the Rising Sun expansion since it since it um first came around in in um in nineteen eighty. Yeah, the uh, after Sinus first edition had been uh, released, uh, I believe it was Ed Symbolist happened to in invite Lee Gold mm -hmm. to write a mm -hmm. Japanese uh, ex expansion, and it was released using the Sinus first edition rules as a standalone game, mm -hmm. and I think uh, at the time it was quite popular. I think I think it was one of the earliest. Uh, Japanese role-playing games, and it was certainly the first one, as far as we know, that was written by a female writer. Mm -hmm. And um, when it came to now, as far as far as as far as what came, as far as what came first, I um, that the that's a that's a topic that's always going to be um, debatable. Um, but even but even so. When I think of when I think about the early '80s, I'm, I I I can't help but wonder if one of the things that spurred it on was that was that brief window where there was a bit of a ninja craze in, in pop culture. Yeah, quite possibly. I think over in the UK, we'd, we'd probably be uh, the TV serial Shogun. That's de I'd say that's definitely one thing that could that could that could spur it on. Um, plus, I get the feeling it was it was inevitable simply because um, you can only you can only do you can o you can only do um, an XP of of uh, Europe so many times before that before that starts to get a little too familiar. 
<laughs> yeah, so there's been various mm-hmm. versions over the years, and uh, I think our last incarnation of CNS, we've done a little bit of research on it. Yeah. But when when it comes now, when it came to um, now one of the th- one of the things that has always has always been brought up in one form or another with chivalry and sorcery that I can see where some people are coming from, but al- but also dis- also disagree is the complexity of the matter. Um, and uh, I th- oh, go ahead. Yeah, I th- I think the a lot of that is misconstrued by the fact that the character generation is quite involved. Mm-hmm. And you end up with quite a detailed, fleshed-out character before you start play. Which I, th- I think, th- I think that was from way from the way you described it. I think that was something that w- that was intentional. That the, of making characters that are that are more that are more than just a um, a one off, a one off kind of she- a one off kind of sheet for dungeon crawls the way. A lot of characters in um, D in D and D could be set up as. Yes, yeah, so your character has a place in society, and they have a role, and it's how they actually fulfil that role. Whether it's a serf trying to become a knight, or a knight who's actually having to look after his lands. And it's it's something I find in, it's something I find interesting, especially given the. Um, university background that a lot that the first generation of role players had um, I can't comment on that cuz <laughs> I've not been to university so <laughs> well obviously not obviously not ev- obviously not everybody but I remember but I remember I remember hearing st- hearing stories on the matter and the and a lot of the pe- a lot of the people who start who started out in di- who started out with different groups, different wargaming groups, um, had some had some sort of historical interest or historical um, background. And universities just happen to be the um, con- the convenient way to convene. If you'll if you'll excuse my du- if you'll excuse my uh, double wording. Yes, and I think that. A lot of the university groups, they possibly they were looking for that little bit more in the game mm-hmm. instead of the old kick the door and kill the monster, grab the loot. Which I think they got to the point that they just thought there's got to be more to it than this. Which there's no, there's nothing wrong with that, but some, but there should be a place for get for um for get for for getting a burger and a beer and get and getting a fi- and getting a finer meal. Yes. And uh, as my current set of players know, the most dangerous creature they've had to face in the game I've been running is the tax collector. <laughs> Which I, I would I would be incredulous about that, but. I've read through Pratchett's work, and that's basically what the auditors are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the bi- the biggest evil in the universe are tax men. Yep. So, uh, but, but yeah, it's. Uh, but, no, sorry, carry on. But even even with even with that, I mean, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to involved um characteriza- characterization. Um, would you would you say would you say that it's would you say that it's one of those things where the where the best way to bring somebody in is to have them have them come up with the full character before they even start rolling stats? No, it's it's why we have the quick start available for free. Uh, that's already got seven pre-generated characters that you can begin play with immediately, mm-hmm. and. You can get a flavour for the game by using the quick start, and then there's nothing to stop you carrying on playing those pre-gen characters throughout your game. Yep. Uh, it, it's once you've got yourself into the game, you can then look at 
do I, do I want to create my own character and then go through it then? By which point we hope that people have enjoyed playing the game, but they want to go and create their own character. Yeah. Now, when it when it comes to when it comes to the um, when it comes when it came to the core, the core mechanic of of, C, of CNS, um, the whole the whole um, D one hundred and D and D ten. Yes. Um, has that has when you when you've um when you've brought people in to to the table has that has that been one that has that been a mechanic that they've um take that they've taken to relatively quickly uh yes they have because the whole idea of rolling a percentile to get equal to under your total skill chance mm -hmm. is familiar with a, a, a number of games but what we have is the additional d10 which gives you a scale the effect with one being low 10 being high so if you succeed and you've only rolled a one on the extra d10 you've only just succeeded despite how much you've rolled under your skill chance you've only just succeeded on a 10 you've achieved a critical and likewise if you fail a one you've only just failed on a 10 you've critically failed but from a from a GM's point of view, if they're creating a scenario and they're looking at a particular situation, it gives them the option of having 20 different outcomes for a specific skill check. Mm -hmm. So they could say, if you're looking for a clue, if you fail and you've rolled a one on the extra D10, they may have only just missed the clue, but they found something that could eventually lead them to the clue. All right, I, I can uh, never, uh, never really get that. Um, especially because, because I, we, yeah, yeah, we've we've played so many games where it is very much black and white. You've either mm -hmm. succeeded or failed. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's nice to say, "Well, you failed, but." And dependent on what the, the level of the failure is, is how bad a failure or how good a success you've made. Mm -hmm. yeah. Especially, and I can, I can especially see that with the um, rising prevalence of the fail forward um, philosophy over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And, but, the, I mean, but that, it's, it was something that was introduced in 1996 in third edition cns so it isn't a new game mechanic it's just that we've refined it a little bit yeah and at this point I, at this point i will i will admit that um i ended up jumping stri straight from thir straight from third to fi um fifth edition and one of the things that was made was made clear with um with the development of fifth edition was trying to was trying to um Trying to stre trying to streamline matters. Um, wh when you when you were s when you all were sitting sitting down to ha hammer hammer out what that was going to entail, what were s what were some of the things that you felt needed to be streamlined from say fourth to fifth edition? Um, well, f fourth edition was a development of third. Where we we actually took over the IP in ninety seven, and with Fourth edition, what we wanted to do was try and recapture some of the flavor of first and second edition. And we started to put back a lot more medieval flavor into fourth. Um, but fourth was more a stepping stone, really, to what we've ended up with in fifth. Uh, one of the things that was in third and fourth was the third D10 was one is low, 10 is high for a success, and 10 is low. Um, one is high for a failure. Mm -hmm. And so we all felt there was a bit of a clash there. So we just made it one to 10, low to high for both success and failures. Um, there were other streamlinings that we did with, uh, with the skills on how your, your final skill chances re resolved. Uh, the, can't really go into it here, but it, it's, but well, we've actually streamlined that so it's a lot easier to do it 
and makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, if you have played third edition CNS, we also wanted to make it some way backwards compatible. So you would be able to take your third edition character straight into fifth edition with not a lot of changes. Which I, 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 can, de I can definitely approve of that. Of that. Um, uh, now, when it came... Now, um, getting to getting to land of the rising sun for, for a bit when um talk to me about how, about how how where the foundation was laid as far as as far as wanting to get wanting to do a ex, this particular expansion again was this something that you had pl had planned in the in the back of your in the back of your minds when 5th edition was being developed or was or did the spark come a bit more recent uh, we'd actually had Land of the Rising Sun in our uh, war chest for the last 15 years. And uh, Lee had originally up looked at updating it for third edition. And we, would, we were looking at uh, releasing it under fourth edition. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we had a family tragedy which knocked us back for a, a decade. And so it's with the release of fifth edition, we've been able to update the manuscript that we already had and bring it up to date to fifth edition. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, so, now, how, how large, how large would, how large, besides obviously stretch goals, how large would you say that the, um, man, the manuscript for Land of the Rising Sun would approximately be? We're looking at about 320 pages without any of the CNS 5th edition main rules in. This is why it's an expansion this time around and not a standalone game. Uh, if we'd have included all of the rules that were, would be needed to make it standalone, we'd probably be getting close on six and sort of 800 pages. Yeah. And yeah. While while I while I would have no problem hauling around an eight hundred page book because I've hauled around encyclopedias in the past, um, it's not ex it's not exactly good to it's not exactly good to flip through. No, um, uh, yeah. yeah, you have a copy of fifth edition, so we would have to port over all of the a bulk of the character generation, the combat, the magic system, most of the spells, most of the religion rules and you can see how if we had to do that it would be a huge book whereas at the moment as 320 pages we're adding some extra vocations some additional spells some additional skills and some some neat new species that you can play mm -hmm. uh, for example you can play uh, spirits of artifacts so your character could be a temple bell yep. that's inhabited by a spirit that can shape change into a human. Mm -hmm. Now, when when it came to when it, one of the things that I that I really enjoyed with the digital version of Chivalry and Sorcery is the uh, navigation setup that you have with all with all of the te with all the um, side tabs. <laughs> Art, yes. When, because the thing is, I am very, very big on navigation within PDFs. Um, like when it comes to when it comes to bookmarks, when it comes to indices, when it comes to hyperlinks, pot potentially. Even though I understand why some people can't do that, um, just being able to get to given information quickly is vital. And when it comes to the hyperlink setup that you had with with CNS. Is that going to be followed through with Rise, Land of the Rising Sun? Uh, we would plan to do so, yes. At the moment, we're, we're in the proofing stage mm -hmm. of the book. And when we've got the proofing finished, we're then going to look at the chapter order that we currently have and do we want to move it around? And uh, we'll wait until we've done that before we start looking at the hyperlinks. Uh, Andy, who, who does all of our layouts, 
I drove him crazy with CNS because he'd just finished doing all the hyperlinks. Then I'd want a chapter moved around or a few pages shifted. I'm, ge and, uh, I'm guessing there were a few colorful messages in the interim. Oh, yes. It, it's a good job most people don't understand black country uh, dialect. And um, although to be, I don't think I'd have to, to, under, to understand the language of anger. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, so, now something else that I did, something else that I did find interesting is that the era that you decide, the era that you decided to go with for, for this, and it's been a while, it's been a while since I went, since I, um, read through the writ, read through the original Land of the Rising Sun, so I'm not sure if this was the case back then, but you're going with um, 850 to 1500 CE, which yes, I believe I believe that it I believe that would be just before the Sengoku Jedi. Uh, now I'll just pull up the the period that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the the chapter on history actually commences with the Yamato era, mm -hmm. and I think that's even earlier than uh, eight fifty. It's uh, certainly I'd certainly say that it's. Uh, uh, and let, let me yeah, correct. It, it, uh, it, it, I have to correct myself. The Shingo, the Sengoku Jidai era ended in the um, in the seventeenth century. Yeah, the, as I say, we start the the Japanese history in the uh, Land of the Rising Star, so starts with the Yamato era, around about six hundred uh, CE, mm -hmm. and goes mm -hmm. all the way up to, uh, as you say, the the. Uh, well, wait, let me just make sure I'm getting the right. The uh, to the Ashikaga Wars in the mid 15th century, mm -hmm. uh, that takes you up to the Takagawa Shogunates, which will, if anybody's ever watched Shogun, it's that period. Yeah, and yeah, and when. But even but even with uh, that, uh, in some uh, oh, so, sorry, I'm getting, uh, getting an echo again. Yes, uh, if you want to carry on. Um, um, when it comes to the when it comes to the um set, when it comes to the setting matter, I'm get I'm guessing that. There's go that there's going to be a bit of an aside about what one could ex what one could expect from di from different eras because obviously with the with different eras you have different um, tiers of technology. Yeah, we we have we have information on what weapons are available, what skills you might encounter, uh, what vocations are maybe disallowed in that mm -hmm. period. And uh, we also mentioned whether it's a weak shogun, a strong shogun era, or if it or, it, or if it is a contending clans. So there's a, there's information on uh, role playing opportunities in the different periods. Mm -hmm. But it's very much the case that uh, each period has a summary of the history of that period. But one of the one of the things that I that I saw with I saw within the text on the pa on the page is the notion of not of not of if someone wanted to veer veer a little bit from the his, from the historical end of things or possibly do a what if version of parts of history that that would that would be accounted for. Uh, yeah, it's it's more a case of this is the historical Japan. Um, this is some of the ideas that they had regarding magic. Uh, we've got Buddhism and Shintoism in there. Mm -hmm. and it's very much a case of 
if you want to play a historical Japanese CNS game, you can ignore all of the magic and all of the folklore that goes along with it. But if you want to include the folklore that is part of Japanese history and myth, it is there. And speaking speaking of um, speaking of folklore. Now this might ad this is admittedly a bit of a deep cut, but I'm cu I'm curious if if um there's if there's been any consideration to addressing the Ainu. Yes, uh, one of the things that we ha uh, that we have looked at the Ainu are in, are dis discussed, and we have looked at uh, ensuring that they are treated respectfully. They're certainly not described in detrimental terms. Yeah, I was I was mainly curious if that yeah. if they if they were if they would make if they would make an appearance within the book within the book because that's definitely one that's definitely one aspect of 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 Japanese history that isn't that isn't discussed often. Yeah, that they are mentioned they are mentioned in uh, the book. Mm -hmm. In in the same way as in the CNS core rule book, we include the Jews mm -hmm. that we include Judaism and Islam. All right. In the core rule book. Now when when it when it comes to when it comes when it comes one of the other things that was that was brought up is the is the um elements when it comes to the when it comes to the magic when it comes to the um, magic rules for land of the rising sun and something i'm curious about is how obviously there's going to be some degree of difference but how different would would the magic system for land of the rising sun be compared to its um setup in cns it's it's compatible. We use the same guidelines for it, but it's the different types of uh, users of magic that we have. Mm -hmm. And you might, for example, have more of an entertainer who might use a little bit of magic in their entertaining. You might have a dancer who might utilize magic. And um, so the the complete the complete range of new vocations for mages and new modes of magic but it follows the game mechanics that we have in core in the core rule book mm -hmm. um, for example there would be nothing to say you having a japanese mage who decides to go looking for com magical components in the west while traveling along the silk road Um, I mean, we, we we found Chinese coins in Britain uh, dating to the medieval period. So there's no reason why merchants wouldn't have travelled along the Silk Road. Yeah, and whenever 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 the concept of of a major or equivalent in a in a in a Japanese fiction comes to mind, the Thing I will, the thing that always comes up to me is something like an onmyunji, and I'm. Would it be fair of me to say that that's a potential um, vocation within Land of the Rising Sun? Uh, right. So you'll have to bear with me while I pull up my <laughs> my my PDF. Uh. I am. I am not going to pass judgment on 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 bringing up notes because. Well, as G as GMs, that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is more a case of me pulling up the various uh, laid out chapters that I'm currently uh, updating. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I can I can better give you an idea of types of uh, mages that you were likely to encounter so some of the new ones uh you can get uh, henga yokai mm. mages or instinctive mages uh there's tengu 
you could have a musical instrument spirit mage, which is a musical instrument uh, inhabited by a spirit, mm -hmm. which uses mm -hmm. elemental magic. Uh, we've got I Ching diviners. Which divi yes. diviners would definitely yeah. make would definitely yeah. make sense culturally yeah. speaking. Yeah. And uh, I say there's a few others, but mm -hmm. uh, the, we've got astrologers, uh, a dancer, singer, or musician mage, uh, a, a mage who creates his spells with paint by painting images. Yeah, so um, there's a, there's a whole a whole raft of new type of mages. Yeah. But just expands yeah. on what's in the core rule book. Of the ones you met, of the ones you mentioned, um, the the astrologer would probably would probably be the closest approximation. Um, and now, obviously, uh, the way I describe it is a um, is a vast sim is a vast simplification. Yeah, I say, I I don't I don't generally play. Uh, many Japanese games, Japanese role-playing games. Mm -hmm. I've, I've played a little bit of Bushido, and I hold my hand up that this is my first encounter with Land of the Rising Sun, despite playing CNS such a lot. Well, um, I, rem I, remember Stan I remember Stan Lee once saying, every comic is someone's first, and I think that something similar can apply to RPGs. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've come to looking at uh, Land of the Rising Sun with almost a fresh face and basing all of my experience of uh, J uh, Japanese style games on Bushido. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been quite refreshing looking at making some of the game mechanics fit with uh, fifth edition. And admittedly, I. I am coming from a slightly different, slightly different perspective because, um, I've, I, I've run, I've run the original version of Oriental Adventures way, way back in the day, um, when yeah. it when it was Karator. I ran the third edition version of Oriental Adventures when they tried to kit bash in, um, Legend of the Five Rings, with mixed results. Nobody ta nobody talks about L five R second edition for that reason. <laughs> um <laughs> and and stuff like stuff like Sun, um Sengoku Diceless and a few and a few other games and more recently with um with um Japanese RPGs made in Japan like Tenra Bancho 0 um and it's a lot of it is due to the fact that I gr that um I grew up with more samurai films than I'd care, than I'd care to admit. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. um, and uh, and a lot of of course a lot of them were through Kurosawa who has outright admitted that the only reason he became a director was so they didn't excuse he had an excuse to edit something. Yeah. <laughs> but that given how given how with C with CNS there is a big emphasis on a character being a a piece in the in the puzzle that is a given society. There, yes. That brings me to a couple um a couple questions on whether or not this will be um, filled in with Land of the Rising Sun. One is if you see a, if you if you've seen a lot of samurai films, you'll you'll note that there's that there's always a big deal made about um so, made about swordsmanship schools. And the yes. and the techniques that I have is that is that something that's going to be represented within Land of the Rising Sun? Uh, I, I, as far as I'm aware, yes. I mean, I've actually read the translation of Miyamoto Musashi. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got the five volume paperback, and if I presume that you've read that, and there is yes. a number number of descriptions of the different techniques and the different schools and 
So it, it ties in with one of the ideas we've got for an expansion expansion of the core rule book. Um, we, we have got something we're working on, which is the uh, sort of advanced combat uh, mm-hmm. with adding techniques and the, what you're talking about with the different schools and the styles would fall into what we would be looking at, an expansion to the combat system mm-hmm. that we are working on. But yes, I, I am familiar with uh, what you're describing. Yeah. The uh, the other factor, and I'm, I'm guessing this is something that would that would more that would more naturally fall in, is is um the notion of mass combat. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, as, sure. as, mm-hmm. as as someone who backed the uh, the core rule Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. You will be aware of Ars Bellica, the war game rules that we're working on. Yes. Um, the, we're, we're stuck at the moment because of the stupid lockdowns that we have. But uh, the, the guys who's got all the miniatures painted is in one place. The guy who will do all the photography is somewhere else. And I'm in a third location. And we can't actually get together because of different county borders although we're only like two miles apart. And that's what well, that's been the big delay with Ars Bellica. Mm-hmm. It's not being able to get the uh, final miniature pictures that we need. As, as anybody who's ever picked up a war game rule book, you can't do a war game rule book without pictures of miniatures. Mm-hmm. And... And the way that we've got Ars Bellica set up, um, you point up your miniatures based on WYSIWYG. So, yes, we would be looking at a supplement to Ars Bellica which would cover uh, in, uh, sort of Japanese armies as well as European and other, other periods as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'll give a shout out to another British company. Um, and if you've ever seen a test of honor, as uh, great set of uh, miniatures for their for their Japanese skirmish game. Mm-hmm. But uh, yes, we we will be looking at uh, mass battles for it as well. Yep. Yeah. The the main reason that the main reason that I'd ask about that kind of thing is obviously you're dealing with a period in time where sit where civil wars was constant mm-hmm. um, and, ta- and taking that in taking that into account i'm i'm assuming that the idea that the idea of of ca- of characters or tables creating creating samurai clans is is uh, is in the cards yeah it's going to be down to i would say individual gms on how far they want to take that uh i mean with the code to generation system if you are of a noble caste uh you will have your clan and you'll have some initial information about that but we don't want to pigeonhole gms into saying it's got to be this way mm-hmm. um, it's uh, it's up to the GM how they want to run their own campaign and how they want to build the clan structure. In, in a similar way, in the core rule book, I use the my local area as a sample campaign mm-hmm. setting based on the information in the Doomsday book. But that's not to say that that's how you have to do it. Um, as, as CNS has got a lot of optional rules and we don't want to pigeonhole you into playing it in one way. Yeah. Uh, all, all of the design yeah. team, we will run CNS slightly differently to each other. Yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, obviously when it came to character creation, one of the, one of the major pillars was the has been the um hor- has been the horoscope, the uh, bir- the yes. birth sign, what have you. Um, is that is that still going to be in? 
is something equivalent to that going to be in Land of the Rising Sun, just obviously not using the same signs as in CNS? Yes, it is. Uh, it, the, the horoscope is in there. And it is not the Western horoscope either. And I'm... <laughs> Yeah, obviously, obviously it would. So, it, 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 yeah, it, it's it's more the uh, Asian mm -hmm. horoscope. Could but, you, uh, given given that, could you could you um give a, could you give a few examples on on um on what on what on what signs would favor what what skills obviously I, obviously I, I can't ask you to do it with all with all all the signs but just a few, just a few examples on whether on where they'd be similar or different okay okay let's have a look so Thank you for humoring me when it comes when it comes to something that would need to be looked up like this. <laughs> yeah, I say it's uh, it's how powerful is my laptop when I'm opening lots of uh, chapters in in design. I think the I think the main the main thing that I'm that I'm kind of getting at with this is that would would these would these signs in this case be um um re re reskins of the same of the same um, favored the same favored skill setups, or would or would they confer different um favored sk favored skills ben benefits and so on? Okay, so um, if your say your coach's father was a drum player, mm -hmm. he would have the skill. Uh, um, the music skill drums, and so there's the the whole the whole social class tables are completely new, and there's some there are some new skills that are appearing. Uh, sumo wrestling, for example, mm -hmm. uh, atemi as a, a new healing art, uh, which will include acupuncture. Just uh, skimming through. And s since you met, since you uh, mentioned something like s something like sumo, would it would it also be fair to say that a, that a appearance of ka there will be appearance of things like kabuki and no? Uh, yes. Uh, so just okay. So uh, your question about horoscope, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, one of them is dragon, and your favourite skills for that is seamanship and law. Um, monkey would be law and thievish skills. Mm -hmm. uh, tiger, charismatic and combat. Uh, so there, are, there are, there are. Uh, what, what we the Japanese are using this Chinese zodiac, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. that's uh, what the horoscope in Land of the Rising Sun is based on. Which makes which makes sense. Um, and I will I will I will I will admit to that on. I've, that I specific that I specifically want 
brought up um, Kamuki and No because the, because of their presence as the as the um, dominant the dominant forms of theater. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, as I say, we've got we've got about uh, twenty chapters. Actually, there's more than that. Look at the list. It's a huge list. So it's just sort of me still finding my way around because mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't done a printout. So so I've tried to uh, look at the right chapter for you. And I'd, I'd imagine that it's a bit tricky to do, to do that when when they're all when they're all in separate files. Yeah. Uh, so. I need to, if I go to the skills chapter, that might. Uh, mm -hmm. and this is why I say that if we'd if we'd made it a standalone game, it would be eight hundred pages. Um. Because a lot of the skills that are available, they're already in the core rulebook. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So all we have got is a page reference to the core rulebook instead of the actual whole skill description. So. I'm guessing in that there's, okay. there's, a, there's a focus on what skills would be new. Yes, yeah. Uh, and in fact, there's, I mean, for example, one of the new skills is silkworm raising. And tea growing. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're so inclined, you can have mm -hmm. uh, origami as a skill. Which sounds... Um, yeah. Oh, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure oh, some people will get some, get some enjoyment out of that. Oh, we, we had a huge discussion uh, about uh, basket weaving. How important a skill that was in the core rule book, mm -hmm. and then I then I pointed out that if you if you look in the sh uh, armor, you've got wicker shields, and to make basket weaving. Yeah, so under the art and entertainment skills, one of the new skills is uh, Anagata. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what we have is the, the male actor could convincingly portray a woman, even a geisha or courtesan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And geisha were sent to watch Anagata act in order to learn to be properly feminine. So... Uh, um, I, I'm sure I've, I have seen uh, when we've with with the fluff sections that we describe uh, theatre, etc. Which I can, um, I can definitely, I can definitely get behind yeah, that. Um, um, especially uh, other, 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 yeah, so other new skills we've got: puppeteering, mm -hmm. tattooing, mm -hmm. uh, kamari. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, that is. Yeah, and yeah, I say sumo wrestling is there. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. sake, sake brewing, and uh, I say that this is the, the th uh, as I mean with the uh, cooking skills. Uh, We've got some new forms of cooking. Kaya uh, Rayari, uh, which I've probably said wrong. Uh, is the, is uh, that per, those particular, uh, those those particular uh, skills is, is something I can get behind? Um, Yeah, as I say, there's a whole no. a whole raft mm -hmm. of new skills, and in some cases, mm -hmm. um, additional information on some existing skills that relate to uh, Land of the Rising Sun. All right, that makes that makes sense. Um, now, I, also, I did, I could I when I looked at the uh, stretch goals that you guys have, I I couldn't help but have a have a bit of a chuckle at the fact that. Um, the first one that you that you unlocked is a trio of adventures, one of which written by 
um, Graham Davis, who has, been, who has been, who has visited the temple in the past. <laughs> so yes, small world that. Um, yes, he's uh, yeah. We've we've worked on Gra with Graham on another product which hasn't yet been released, um, and that that's a best area of European folklore. And mm -hmm. uh, that's one that will we probably won't go to Kickstarter on that. We'll probably just get that released uh, uh, sort of later in the year once we've got this Kickstarter out of the way. Which def definitely makes definitely uh, makes sense. Um, now, as, now, um. I do want to congratulate you on, get, on managing to get so far past the initial stretch goal of ten, not not stretch goal, the initial goal of um, ten thousand pounds, since it's currently at fifteen point six thousand. Um, now you guys have you guys have set it up as um Janu as January thirty first as the end date. Yes. Given given that, what what would be the release window that you'd have in mind for the PDF version? We're looking at the PDF going out. We're, we're aiming at the end of Feb. End of end of February, and I'm guess I'm guessing some, I'm guessing sometime in summer when it comes to the physical book. Well, the the point that we release the PDF to the backers will be the point that we we're actually sending the PDF to our printers, mm -hmm. and so we're anticipating. Four to six weeks to allow for it to be printed and delivered to our warehouse, and then we'll be looking to uh, dispatch out to the backers from that point on. Which is why we're saying May for delivery of the uh, physical book. All right, I got you. Well, I'll I'll certainly be looking forward to it because it it. Through, with something like this, where it's, it's expanding the potential sandbox of what people can um, ro what people can role play in worldwide. Yeah, and uh, we, we were quite pleased with how we managed to fulfil the last, the previous Kickstarter by delivering the rule books on time. And I think most people actually got theirs in uh, by the end of Feb, which was when mm -hmm. we said we'd deliver. And we got the last of the stretch goals, or the last of the unlocked stretch goals, out to uh, backers just prior to Christmas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, I, I'm under instructions by the uh, she who must be obeyed, but uh, not to go to Kickstarter until you've got the book ready to go. <laughs> Well, given, given given certain stories that have come that have come around with with certain other kickstarters I can't name, that is yeah. completely understandable. And uh, I, I, I've backed far too many, and know how long I've had to wait for some as well. So, yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a very patient man, so I can so I can wait I can wait as long as I need long as I need to in order to get in order to get something, but. I am well. I am well aware that, in some regards, I am the exception. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I've. I've seen. I mean, I, I'm quite happy to sit and wait because it gives me time to just work out when it arrives. Where the bloody hell am I going to put it? And do I do I have to try and beg and to see if we can have that extension I need for a new game room? <laughs> Uh, give, gives gives time to work on the sales pitch. Yes, it's uh, yeah. Forty years of collecting. It does sort of suddenly you think, I'm not a hoarder. I'm a collector. And that even after all this time, the war gaming bug hasn't gone, and I've got far too much plastic from a certain British company. I think. Uh, look, it doesn't. It doesn't take a genius for me to for me to figure out which company that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially, and, uh... especially how I've ha especially the fact that I've had the the epitome of a love hate relationship with said company. Yeah, 
haven't all their fans. Um, I'd I'd say I'd say the I'd say the vast majority I'd say the vast majority of them. That's a, that's precisely the case. Um, yeah, and I, I'm so thankful that 15 millimeter is so popular nowadays. Um, I'm still finding somebody who'll let me field my 10 Tiger tanks against them. <laughs> um, uh, and and I, although I will I will free, I will freely admit that it was thanks to so stuff like the Ninth Age that rekindled that the interest, especially since I was able to get a game that was that detailed without having to pay for it. Yeah, but with. With that, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the myths of time zones to come up to the temple. And uh, by all means, I'm happy that you're a backer, and I hope that you've enjoyed uh, the material that we put out from the first Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. oh, I, cer I certainly have, and I and I look forward to seeing how Land of the Rising Sun de um, develops. As I meant, as I mentioned yesterday, when I was covering it during the Kickstarter spotlight, I don't, I don't want one, ga I don't want one particular game to corner the market in this particular style of play. And uh, now that's there, there's there's a lot of good games out there, and it, it isn't the '70s anymore where you've got half a dozen that can dominate. But uh, it's got to be. We've got to look at it as an expanding hobby, mm -hmm. and like with any mm -hmm. hobby, uh, the hobby is only as strong as the new blood that you can attract. Yeah. Because the likes, uh, of, the likes of my generation, we're approaching retirement age, and we were at the start. And I um, um, obviously, I'm no, I'm no spring, I'm no spring chicken, but. <laughs> The sole reason I even I even set up the temple to begin with was to expand the hobby. Yeah, and we can't we can't turn around and sell every game. At, Look, to expand the hobby, you've got to breed because that would be totally wrong. Well, unfor unfortunately, um, my cloning device is still on the fritz. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, my my daughter my daughter had to dabble with. Uh, uh, a sci-fi uh, miniatures game uh, for a brief while, but uh, she then went on to college and uni, and that was the end of that. But reg regardless, anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah, and if you Google the Black Country, you'll know that drinking is fairly mandatory here. <laughs> As long as, I'm, as long as I'm not being talked into drinking wine, I think I'll be good. Oh, yeah. first time I went drinking, uh, my friend's uncles were expecting me to drink a pint every 15 minutes. But you, you, get, you, get, you get to learn which are the best beers to drink. Well, I, I just Googled it, and one of the first images I see is beer drinking champion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's 30, 30 pints a night wasn't unusual for drinking mild. So, oh, so sounds like my, <laughs> sounds like my kind of place. <laughs> but yeah. and and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>